Good afternoon, everyone. Allison Scoberg here today. I am here with HCC uh, Vast Academy, Karen Sprague. Um, today's webinar is being recorded, and so everybody that is attending today and that registered will get a copy of the slides, uh, as well as the recording, as well as Karen uh, and at Vast Academy's contact information. Um, on a separate note, um, today's uh, webinar, we're going to be talking about Government Benefits 101. There are a lot of slides in this presentation, and we may not get to all of them, but that was kind of by design because the slides that are in here, um, even if we don't get to them, are important. And since you're getting a copy of the slides, you'll have that information. We're going to try to hit it on as much as possible. So from a housekeeping perspective today, you guys are in webinar mode, so we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're there. And we do want to take as many questions as possible, so you can put your questions in the chat box. Um, we have our contact information in the chat box as well, and it'll also be in the slides that are going to be uh, coming out. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I just wanted to, to, for all of the people that are new with us today that they've never attended our webinar, um, welcome. We're glad you're here. For people that have attended in the past, uh, we're certainly glad you're back. Uh, Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm. Um, we have over 30 years experience. We're an advisory consulting firm, um, nationally certified as social security advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Um, I eat, sleep, and breathe special needs both personally and professionally as a parent myself, but also as the owner of Consolidated Planning Group, um, again, an advisory consulting firm specifically for uh, special needs. Uh, we specialize in things like protection plans, lifetime care plans, uh, transition planning. Um, people come to us and they say, um, you know, how much do I need to fund my special needs trust? Or, you know, my child maybe isn't there yet, but we're still hopeful and optimistic. We want to plan for the worst, but hope for the best. Um, we're able to help um, with all of those things. The key thing about planning for special needs is our situation is specialized. When we have a loved one with a disability that may have care needs the rest of their life, not just ours, we have to plan carefully because as parents, you know, we may spend 25 to 35 years in retirement, but our kids with a disability may have 25 to 35 years worth of care once we're gone. So careful planning really matters and having money in the right buckets matters, especially for our topic at hand today, which is Government Benefits 101. Um, when it comes to financial advisors, fewer than one-tenth of a percent of all financial advisors in the U.S. focus on special needs planning. And we always just suggest that your situation is specialized. It is really important that you work with a specialist, not a generalist, when it comes to planning um, for your loved one with a disability. And this is true for the, um, the legal representative that you might have, like an attorney, for instance. You really want to work one, with one that is focused on the state planning, focused on special needs, as opposed to uh, an attorney that may work in a generalized setting, a, a generalist um, because it's really important. Um, the, the, the financial advisor, we're the money. I always say we're the money and they're the paper. The, the attorneys are the paper. They're your legal documents. These are so important, um, critically important to your planning process. And you need both parties. A lot of times attorneys get calls um, that should come to us about how much do I need to fund a special needs trust or what do I need to do to apply for SSI and things like that. And then we get calls of I need to set up guardianship and um, set up a special needs trust. We work very closely with attorneys all across the state. So if you need a referral of someone good in your area uh, that you can work with on, on the legal matters, um, certainly reach out to us and we'll be happy to provide that information. So um, today, we again, we want to invite you to put your questions in the chat box, and again, we're going to get to as many as possible. And from a time perspective, we're going from 12 to 1 today. Sometimes we have people that join us um, from our uh, podcast, and if you're joining from a podcast and you want a copy of today's slides, you can email us at contact for, for um, contact at cpgcares.net. That's contact at cpgcares.net, and we'll be happy to send you a copy of those slides. So <clears throat> there is a lot of confusion when it comes to government benefits. There are a lot of terms. There's a lot of um, little acronyms 
that sounds uh, similar or synonymous, and there's other ones that don't sound similar or synonymous, and they actually are. So there's a lot of confusion. So this Government Benefits 101 is designed um, to help um, work through some of the confusion of the different pro um, programs that are out there, how and when to apply um, what to do to get ready for your application, um, and understand how some things work when it comes to the Social Security Administration. So first things first, we're going to talk about SSDI versus SSI, okay? So Social Security Disability Insurance is also called SSDI. Sometimes it's referred to RSDI, Retirement Survivors Disability Income. Sometimes as parents, we hear it referred to um, as childhood disability benefits or CDB. And for 40 years, um, the CDB was called Disabled Adult Child Program, DAC. So there's a lot of confusion on the Social Security disability, okay? So the source of payment through the disability, uh, it's through the Disability Trust Fund. It is an insurance that a worker pays into when they pay Social Security taxes on their wages, okay? It's going to pay benefits to a disabled individual who are unable to work regardless of their income and resources, but the key is, is that they had to pay into the system. So if we have a loved one with a disability that never worked, they don't necessarily qualify for SSDI under their own record, but they may qualify for it under a parent's record, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Benefits for workers and adults disabled since childhood must meet insured status. Excuse me. So a lot of times when we first apply for benefits for our kid, they, they, they may apply for SSDI and SSI. They're two very separate programs. And a lot of times what happens is we're going to get that denial letter from SSDI first. And a lot of times this is a very upsetting letter that comes in the mail and it says that, you know, basically that your child is not going to qualify for SSDI benefits. What that letter doesn't tell you is that, number one, typically that SSDI denial letter is a valid letter. They should be denied. Your, your loved one has never worked and that's why they're getting denied. Um, but what that letter doesn't tell you is that they're still processing your application for SSI and there will be a separate letter that will come later on that matter and that, 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 that the matter isn't closed. Okay, so just be aware um, if you have um, a, a child that is transitioning or you've never applied, you're getting ready to apply, maybe they're going to be turning 18 or maybe you just didn't know that you should apply and they're much older than 18. Just keep that in mind that a lot of times that SSDI denial letter comes first. Now, there is a such thing as that your loved one with a disability, maybe they've worked, maybe they've been in the VR program, vocational rehab through the Texas Workforce Commission, maybe they have earned um, some working quarters under their own record, and it is possible that the SSDI would be approved under their own record if they have some work history behind them. Um, you um, can create a, an account on ssa.gov and download their social security statement and full earnings record if they have worked to see what their insured status, the stat, uh, the, the, their insured status and how insured, if they're insured or if they're missing quarters, will show that on their social security statement. Okay, so I've been talking about social security disability. Right now, I'm going to switch gears to SSI, Supplemental Security Income. It's a completely different program. A lot of times people will say, oh, yes, my child gets Social Security. Um, and it's just a term that they throw around, my child gets Social Security, when in all actuality, their child might be getting SSI, Supplemental Security Income. So this is a totally different program. Payments come from the general tax revenues, not the SSA trust funds. It is a needs-based public assistance program that does not require a person to have, have a work history. Um, it, pay, it is for the disabled and the indigent. So a disabled individual who are unable to work and have a, are, are unable to work and earn the substantial gainful amount, which we're going to talk about that, and have limited income and resources. Um, benefits are for children and adults in financial need, but the key is a person could be totally disabled, um, but they might not be indigent. They might not have a financial need. There might be too much household money 
our income and it would um, prevent them from qualifying for SSI. So one of the key things as parents that I want you to understand is that even though our child's disability may have started, you know, from birth, I mean, it could have been any number of years ago that the child's disability started. When we're thinking about SSI, the Supplemental Security Income, if your child is under age 18, it is based off of the parent's income and assets, not the child's, if they are under age 18. So a parent may have applied for SSI previously because their child is clearly disabled and they might have been denied because they had too much income. When that child with a disability turns 18, the rules change. The income and assets is going to be based off of the child's income and assets, not the parent's. So it's going to completely change change once the child turns 18. So even if the child has been denied in the past, prior to age 18, after age 18, you're going to want to apply again. Okay. We're going to walk through uh, what to do and um, when to do it. So disability rules. So SSDI um, for over age 18, um, physical and mental impairment. Uh, the disability is expected to last 12 consecutive months or result in death. It's not and result in death, it's or. Uh, they have a consideration for age, education, per, past work activity, but they have to have the inability to perform um, substantial work activity. And they refer to that substantial gainful amount. To, to, they have to have the inability to work and earn more than the substantial gainful amount. We're gonna talk about that. Okay, so substantial gainful activity. So this number changes every year as um, they have like a cost of living adjustment and things like that. So for 2023, the amount for the substantial gainful activity in the eyes of the Social Security is 1470 gross earnings per month, 1470 gross earnings per month for an individual with a disability. If the individual is blind, that um, substantial gainful amount changes to $24.60 per month, okay? SSI uses a, a measure of um, substantial gainful amount during the initial claims for SSI, okay? SSDI uses substantial gainful amount through the life of the claim, okay? So basically what they're saying is if a person is working and they're earning more than um, 1470 gross per month, <clears throat> then they're simply not disabled. They're earning enough, um, more than enough to hit the substantial gainful amount, okay? So when we're thinking about applying for benefits, fits for our loved one. It's never my opinion that we should keep a person, you know, squashed down in the eyes of, of, of social security. You may want to keep them if they have the a limited ability to, to work full time, you want to, you may want to make sure that they're earning less than the substantial gainful amount. If you want them to be able to be covered under parents record, which we're going to talk about in a few, in a few minutes. But what I believe is, you know, when it comes to what is SSI, SSI is 914 a month, okay? So this is 914 a month SSI. So most would agree that 914 a month is certainly not enough to live off of, okay? So if an individual does have an opportunity to work and even have their SSI offset by their earnings, I think it's okay. I mean, anytime a person can work, they're building quarters under their own quarters for um, SSDI. They're, they're building that work history and they're paying in to the Social Security um, system for, for, for disability and retirement purposes in, in the future. So again, the amount of SSI for 2023 is 914 a month. If, uh, if there's a couple and both parties are disabled, that's 1371 per month. Um, one of the things that I like to mention here is that if you have a loved one that is receiving SSI and they're not working and they're not getting 914 per month, it is possible that you need to submit a rent agreement showing that your loved one is paying rent or paying for food and shelter. If you're getting 600 and something instead of 914 a month, that tells me that your benefit through the Social Security Administration has been reduced by one third 
because you have not submitted a rent agreement saying that your loved one is paying for food and shelter. This is um, something that is easily remedied by submitting a, a rent agreement. It can be a one-page document. It doesn't have to be a 15-page lease or something like that. And it's basically just saying that your loved one is paying rent and they're paying, I, I usually use the amount five or $600 a month that this is the same amount of money that you would charge any boarder and this covers their food and shelter. And then when their SSI comes in, then you move that amount of rent um, from the account the SSI comes into to whoever they are paying rent to. Maybe it's yourself as a parent, maybe they actually do have a lease, um, but you move that money over. And some parents um, use that money for food and shelter and some parents turn right around and they'll put that money in an ABLE account, which we are gonna talk about that today as well, okay? So how do we know if you qualify? So SSI and Medicaid, it's a means-based test, okay? If uh, the individual is single, if they're 18 and over, if they're single, um, then no more than $2,000 assets in the person's name. A married couple um, is 3,000 assets. A child and one parent, so under age 18 and one parent, $4,000 in assets. A child and two parents is $5,000 in assets. Guys, these numbers are ridiculously low. This is the numbers that you can have, and this is all sources. The only things that would not be counted um, in this example um, is one house and one car and assets that you have in a, part, a first party or third party special needs trust or assets that you have in an ABLE account. Those are the only places that you can have things that are not going to be counted against them for the means-based test, okay? So one house and one car, there are some a few exceptions to the one car, if one car is like, you know, 15 years old, they might not count it. Or if there is a huge loan against the car, so the value of the car is basically nothing because you're upside down, sometimes they won't count the second car. And then the third reason that they may not count a second car is if that car could be sold and used for final expenses. That um, And you can read about that on the, on the Social Security website. So SSDI and RSDI and Medicare. So here's some of these terms that we're talking about that are confusing. We've got Medicaid. Again, this is a means-based program. It's for the indigent, okay? It comes along with SSI. There are over 109 Medicaid programs in the state of Texas, okay? So, but the, this is specific Medicaid that comes along with SSI. So when an individual is approved for SSI, Medicaid comes along with that. SSDI, RSDI um, comes along with Medicare, but it's 24 months. There's a 24 month uh, waiting period for the Medicare to kick in. And again, this is based off of the work record and taxes paid into the Social Security for SSDI. Okay, it is possible. Uh, a lot of kids will have SSI and Medicaid first, and then mom or dad will retire or go on Social Security disability themselves. And then their, their adult with a disability is able to be covered under a parent's record. So in that example, the, the child will switch over from SSI to SSDI under a parent's record, also known as childhood disability benefits. And we are going to talk more about that. They'll keep Medicaid if they had Medicaid first when they switch over because there's rules that say that if the individual was getting Medicaid first under SSI and switches over to SSDI under a parent's record, that that increase of the monthly amount, um, that's not going to allow them to kick them off Medicaid. So they're going to keep Medicaid, and then after 24 months, they're going to have Medicare and that's where they'll be concurrently enrolled. They'll be dual eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. When it comes to Medicaid and Medicare, again, it's very confusing, but all you need to know with Medicaid and Medicare is that Medicaid is always the last payer. So if an individual has group health insurance through their parents and through their parents' employer, that's typically primary. If they have Medicare, that would be secondary, and that could be flip-flopped. Medicare could be primary, and then the group insurance secondary, and then Medicaid would always pay third in that example. So always Medicaid is the payer of last resort. Some families ask me if my child is eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare or if my child just gets Medicaid, should I continue to keep them on my group benefits at work? And my answer is yes, 
Okay. Um, when we have a child whose disability began prior to, you know, age, you know, 18 or age of majority, whatever the company suggests, if that's 21, 26, we can keep all of our kids on our benefits until age 26. But when we have a child that has a disability, there are forms you're going to check with HR at your employer, um, check with the insurance company that has your group health plan. But there are forms where you can keep your adult with a disability past age 26 on your group benefits through your employer. And I recommend that. Um, the reason I recommend that is our kids are complicated. They have complicated medical needs. Maybe they have lots of medical appointments and they always see specialists and things like that. From my perspective as a parent, I wanna go where I wanna go and see who I wanna see when I wanna see them. I don't want to be pigeonholed to go see a physician that I don't want to see or that is not going to be good for the level of care that we need. And so that group um, health insurance is going to keep you um, with the freedom of choice. Medicare is accepted any, anywhere that accepts Medicare. Okay, you can go to any doctor. There's no big network. It's anybody that accepts Medicare you can go to. But there are limited providers. Most of the hospitals are going to be in network with Medicaid. But there are limited providers with Medicaid. And often what we find is families that have um, complex um, kiddos, um, whether they're adults or kids, it doesn't matter. Um, a lot of your specialists are not going to be in network with Medicaid. Um, so that's an important note here. So the blue book and um, the Social Security blue book is basically it's basically a medical impairment guide. It's the medical impairment guide that the Social Security Administration uses to determine um, whether or not a person is disabled. So you can, um, you're going to have a link for this, but um, if, you know, if you're attending by podcast, the Social Security Blue Book, you can Google this and, and, and go to the, if your child is over age 18, make sure you're looking at the adult listings, even if their diagnosis happened as a child, and you can put in all of their diagnoses, look every single one of them up and see what it is that is going to need to be proved um, in order for your child to qualify for disability benefits, okay? Um, it, it lists basically what they're trying to see that the impairment is causing. It, it, it's pretty clear. Don't forget the little things. You know, some, some people may have apraxia. Some people... Um, maybe it's an intellectual disability. Maybe there's multiple diagnoses of autism, Down syndrome. Maybe they have chronic migraines. Maybe, I, it just goes on and on and on. And a lot of our kids, um, you know, have multiple diagnoses. So I do want to make sure that you do look all of them up. So what should you apply for and when and when should you apply? So we suggest applying for SSI the month of your child's 18th birthday. Um, if you're going in to the office to apply, you want to call and schedule that appointment a few months in advance for after they turn 18. And what I mean by that is today is April 3rd. So if my child is turning April 3rd today and I call today, they may tell, you, tell me that they don't have any appointments available until July. But if I call in February or March, I might be able to get an appointment for the, this week, right, after my child has turned 18. So that is one way. And it used to be prior to COVID that basically applying for benefits, you did it in person, you scheduled an appointment. We strongly advise against walking into the Social Security uh, Administration office without an appointment unless you have a good six, eight hours to sit down there all day, because that's about what happens. They're very, very busy. Um, so we do suggest having an appointment if you're going into the office. Okay. Now, but since COVID, they do, um, they do take applications um, online, and, um, and it's relatively an easy process. And so what I like about the online thing is this. So this is the link here um, to apply online. Uh-oh, I think I lost, my, I lost my slides here. I think it went to the um, – so anyway, what I was saying is that we've got the um, – bear with me one second. Sorry about that. I think I, I hit one of the links for the um, for the blue book and it it went away. Hang, hang on one second. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. Sorry about that, guys. It's coming. Having is not wanting to get bigger for me. Okay, 
Well, we're going to keep moving, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to um, want to make sure that you go online. If you go online, what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to save the date of the application. It literally takes five minutes uh, to apply, and 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 basically what you're doing is you're getting an you're giving um, an indication of your desire to apply. And basically what it's going to say is that they are going to, um, they're going to call you in a couple of weeks um, and then, um, and then schedule an appointment online. Okay. So what we want you to do is to get ready for that appointment online and get your records in order for that. And in order to do that, I know you guys might not be seeing my slides right now. We are really trying here. Um, in order to do that, you're going to want to get the names, address, and phone numbers of all of their doctors, um, any work experience that they have had, names, address, and phone numbers of um, their any employers. Um, we're going to be looking at um, all of their medications. So they're going to want to know all of the diagnoses and, uh, and approximately the dates is what they're going to be looking for. And they're also going to be looking for um, the any income that they have. They're going to want to know about their accounts, um, what kind of um, what kind of income they have, what's in those accounts. I think we're back in business, guys. Sorry about the slides today. It's kind of crazy. Okay, uh, note to self: don't hit the links. <laughs> um, okay, so so uh, diagnosis history. Have the dates. Um, we want to be able to prove here that their diagnosis um, started if if they if their disability started prior to age 22. You want to have proof that their their disability started prior to age 22 because that's what's going to be able to allow them to be covered under a parent's record um, for childhood disability benefits. Um, so bank statements, last three months of the bank statements, list of the medications. They want to know what the medications are and what they're for. They don't really care about like the frequency and stuff or even the milligrams, but the names of the medications and what they're for. Um, when we're talking about doctors, <clears throat> primary care physician, also known as the PCP, I want you to get a list of any of the other specialty doctors. Maybe it's a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist. They absolutely do not care like about a licensed clinical social worker. They have to be a doctor. Um, but anybody that has evidence of your child's disability or has worked with them for quite some time, um, you want to have that. Um, so what I recommend doing, so I mentioned online, you go online, you state your intent to apply for SSI, and it says thank you, it takes five minutes, and it says they're going to call you in two or three weeks to schedule your appointment. They're not calling you to do the appointment in two or three weeks. They're calling to schedule the appointment. Um, once they schedule the appointment, it could be a couple of weeks to a couple of months out at your actual appointment. But when you do this online, you're saving the date. So when your child is approved, it will be backdated to the date that you did it. And as a reminder, do not do it before their 18th birthday unless you want it based off of your income and assets. Most people's income and assets are going to make the child disqualify. So it's my opinion to wait until after age 18. Okay. Um, the, the last thing that I will say here, and I'll say that as a parent, I might be a little extra, but I would consider chatting with the PCP first and reviewing their records. Remember, in this previous slide, we talked about the Social Security Blue Book, and this is the Medical Impairment Guide. You could go as far as like printing off the pages that matter towards your child's diagnosis. And basically what I did is I said, listen, I'm getting ready to apply for SSI for XYZ child, and they're going to be requesting your medical record, her medical records. Can you um, send me a copy of what you would send if they sent this request? Because I had already reviewed the blue book and I knew what evidence that they are going to be trying to find in the medical records. And I wanted to see if that evidence was clear. And for me, um, it wasn't clear. And I, it wasn't, it was just, you know, sometimes you know, they've gone to digital medical records and sometimes things are clear as mud in those records. Um, and so I simply just asked the PCP to update the record and make sure that they indicated X, Y, and Z diagnosis or, or how that diagnosis um, impairs the activities of daily living of, 
of said child and they were able to correct that. Okay. So what should you expect after you apply? The decision, the, the decision usually takes up to six months and sometimes longer. Um, and sometimes much longer. Okay. So that's, there are other times where a child has a presumptive condition like cerebral palsy. Down syndrome is a presumptive condition. We'll talk about those in a minute and those get approved a lot faster, but it is a slow process. It doesn't take a couple of weeks. Um, it's pretty slow. After your local office has finalized your application is it is sent to the uh, DDS, which is Disability Determination Services in Austin. So when you're applying, you're always dealing with your local office. The ultimate decision comes from the local office. When you're communicating with the Social Security uh, Administration, you're going to want to call your local office, not the national office. Sometimes people think, I know I'm going to really get them because they don't answer the phone. I'm going to call the national office. When you call the national office, basically what happens is you sit on hold for about an hour and then they come on and they say, Thanks for calling. You should have called your local office. Would you like me to give you their number? That's basically how that goes. So sometimes the local offices, um, their phones are rolled to the national office because they are understaffed and they're getting so many calls a day. You have to keep trying. Um, and so that's that. So once you've done your application, you can call this number um, at DDS. I would give it three or four weeks once your application has been completed. And you can call DDS to find out if they have th your child's application. If they don't, that means the local office hasn't sent it and you need to call back to the local office to find out why, um, because nothing's happening if it never leaves the local office. Sometimes you'll call this number and they'll say, yes, we received it on such and such a date and it's waiting to be reassigned. I had one kid's application that was waiting to be assigned for six months because they were understaffed at DDS. So it literally took six months for the case to even be assigned to someone. Um, so, and, and I suggest if your case has not been assigned, keep calling DDS um, every, I would, say, I would say every three, three to four weeks to check the status. The other thing that you can do with DDS is once the case has been assigned, you can check, make sure that they have the file, um, there will be a, a single caseworker that is referred to this case. They have an extension number. They answer their phone. They return calls. Um, you can find out which medical records have been uh, received, which ones are outstanding, and you can call to the local doctor um, and say, listen, you guys received a request from the Social Security Administration for medical records. They haven't received it yet. I was calling to inquire about this request. Guys, sometimes people's SSI application literally gets um, denied because the the PCP or the doctors did not send the medical records. So this is where you can help the process along as a parent. I know it seems like a lot. Everything we do is a lot, um, but this will help the process as well. So we spoke a moment ago about a presumptive dis disability that applications can take as long as six months to get approved, maybe longer. Um, but if a person has a presumptive uh, dis disability, they can be con conditionally approved. Um, and will start paying while they're still going through the process. So um, a presumptive disability um, with the Social Security Administration is also called compassionate allowances. So when you guys get these slides later today, and again, if you're on podcast, um, email us at contact uh, at cpgcares.net. We'll send you the slides. This is the link for the compassionate allowance list. There are over 200 diagnoses out there that are um, considered for a compassionate allowance that might expedite or speed up this application. This is an example of some of them. Of course, we can't put all of the presumptive conditions out there, amputation of a leg at the hip, total deafness, no sound or perception in the ear, total blindness, uh, no light, we got a misspelling there, or, or perception in the eye. Um, bed confinement or immobility uh, without uh, a wheelchair, walker, or crutches due to longstanding condition. We've got stroke, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, and intellectual disability. These are all some of the presumptive conditions. Okay, so let's talk about working and getting SSI because, as I mentioned, it's a it's a program, and that program is going to pay. 914 a month and we do agree that the 914 a month is basically not enough to live off of so if a person does have the ability to work some it doesn't mean that they have to work full time um, some of our loved ones can work maybe they could work one or two days a week maybe they work part time a half day or something along those lines but a lot of times people are confused about how earnings affect their SSI payment so this is an example of how it works 
So, so let's say, for instance, we have 1,200 gross monthly earned income. Okay, so your loved one, they're working and they are earning $1,200 um, gross earnings per month. So if they're working, there's a general excuse, exclusion for $20. $20 and if they're um, earning, you know, if they're working, there's an earned income exclusion of 65. So in that example of $1,200, they're not going to count the first $85, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to now, if we take 85 from 1,200, we've got $1,115. Then that amount is divided by two, and that counts as 557 dollars and 50 cents countable income so in that example the 914 a month would be um they would take away the 557.50 and the amount payable is 356.50 and it runs a month to two months behind okay so for the earnings for the previous months they're, they're not able to do that right as um, immediately. It's, it's usually a month behind. And each month, if an individual that is getting SSI is working, they do have to report their earnings. And you can do that through the portal by uploading your pay stubs. You can do that by faxing documents in. You can also do that um, by hand carrying documents in. One thing that I recommend if you're communicating with the Social Security Administration, I do recommend that you fax documents in as opposed to mail them because um, they go to their mail room, they are understaffed. Um, and when you fax documents and it goes, it gets routed to your representative that's working on the case and it goes electronically. So faxing documents in is going to be a better route. The other thing that I want to tell you that it is critically important when the Social Security Administration sends you a letter that you read it and you read every word and you act in the timeline that it tells you to act. Like if they deny you, you have 60 days to appeal. They mean that. They're not kidding. It's really 60 days. Um, and it's not 60 days. It's 60 days from the date of the letter. It's not 60 days from the day that you got it and this, who shot John and who got the letter and that kind of stuff. They're very serious. If they send you an authorization that needs to be signed because they need to get the medical records, they need that back. That signature needs to be signed and it needs to be sent back in. So do pay attention to those letters. That sometimes they're long and at the end of the day, as a parent, you're like, oh my goodness, I don't even want to look at all this, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it is important and you could miss a critical date if you don't. Okay, so one thing that I want to tell you about that a lot of people don't know about, there is something called a student earned income exclusion, okay? So this is a way where if you have a child with a disability, an adult child with a disability that's between ages 18 and 22, and they're working some, there is a way that you can keep the full SSI benefit and not have it reduced for working. But you have to ask for this. They don't offer this, okay? It is called a, a student earned income exclusion. It's a form. It's something that you, that needs to be applied to your, your loved one's um, SSI. If they're working and between ages 18 to 22, regularly attending school, they do not count up to $2,220 of their earned income per month, okay? The maximum yearly exclusion is um, for 2023 is $89.50. So what does regularly attending school mean? Um, in college or university for at least eight hours a week. And I want to note that a normal um, full-time school load is 12 hours, but for an individual with a disability, um, college or um, university is eight hours a week. Um, or if they're in grades seven to 12, at least 12 hours a week. Or if they're in a training course to prepare for employment, at least 12 hours a week. Um, or um, if you're homeschooling instructed um, from ages uh, grades 7 to 12 for at least 12 hours a week, the student earned income could be applied. So if your child is getting SSI and they're working and they're between the ages of 18 and 22 and their SSI is being reduced for work, you need to ask for the student earned income exclusion. Okay, you're going to do that at your local office. Okay, the Social Security Red Book. So we talked about the Blue Book. The Blue Book is the medical impairment guy that talks about um, what we have to show to prove to be disabled. The Social Security Red Book is a very important book, um, boring, albeit, but 
it's a very important book that talks about working and the impact of working and getting benefits, whether you're getting social security disability benefits or you're getting SSI benefits, that book describes how work affects these programs. Another thing that I want to tell you guys about is if you do have a loved one that is working and getting benefits, um, there is benefits counseling. It's WIPA, W-I-P-A, or Imagine Enterprises. They're in the greater Houston area. They do free benefit counseling. So if you're going to work, thinking about going to work, currently working, you want to make sure you don't mess up Medicaid or mess up certain benefits or want to know the stages of work. There's like five phases of work. Um, the Social Security Administration, just because you work one day or one month doesn't mean that you're going to lose your benefits. There's various fa phases of work. There is something called a nine-month trial work period where you can earn any amount and really not really get kicked off of benefits. And this is a long time before you lose Medicaid and Medicare, but this red book is going to tell you all about that. So check that out. One thing that I want to mention, because in our community, um, when people have gone through a divorce, it's not uncommon for us to see that child support will continue post age 18 um, for your loved one with a disability. And if you fall into that category, it is super important that you understand that child support will be counted um, against the child as income if it is not going to a first party special needs trust. So prior to them turning 18, they don't get SSI, nobody cares, it doesn't matter. But once they turn 18, if you've got a court order that says child support is going to continue post age 18, you need to work with an attorney and you need to get that redirected to a first party special needs trust so that way it won't count against them for SSI. There are a lot of people that in, um, in this example, just because of the child support, they won't qualify for SSI. But if that money is redirected um, to a first party special needs trust, then it won't be counted and they can still qualify for SSI. This is super important. If you find yourself going through a divorce, I would say get this right on the front end, get the wording in the child support order correct on the front end so you don't have to go back and hire attorneys in the future and pay a lot of money. This can be a simple process if both parties agree. Um, you can have it you know, drawn up and signed off on. Um, you know, I, again, you're going to want to work with an attorney on this, and we do have attorneys that we refer out to that handle this type of matter. The, the, the curious thing is, and I just want to mention this, the attorneys that do guardianship and special needs trusts and things like that, they don't do family law, child support matters, but we do have some special needs attorneys that do family law and child support matters that are nuanced and special needs and can be helpful. And my last thing on that, if you do find yourself, I hope you don't, if you do find yourself going through a divorce, um, choose wisely on the divorce attorney that you choose. If you have a loved one that has a disability that has, you know, care needs the rest of their life, I, I do suggest working with a family law attorney that is nuanced um, in special needs. Um, it's going to be better in the long run for your loved one. Okay, so RSDI benefit, childhood disability benefits now referred to as CDB, um, um, childhood disability insurance. So um, what we were talking about before um, is that if you have a loved one that has a disability whose disability started prior to age 22, they have the ability to be covered under a parent's record for um, SSDI also known as RSDI or childhood disability benefits under a parent's record. Again, your, your loved one may already be getting this. For 40 years, they called it uh, Disabled Adult Child or DAC, and then they changed the name to CDB just to confuse us. Uh, childhood disability benefits is what they call it now. So you may have heard it called DAC before, but that's what we're calling CDB. So um, what it means is, is when a, a parent, so we have kids that may never pay into the disability program, okay, but they have the ability to be covered under a parent's record um, if a parent is either retired or goes on Social Security disability um, themselves, okay? So we're going to talk more about that. This is for our uh, adult kids that are 18 years or older. There is survivor benefits um, and retirement benefits for minor children if a person retires and they still have minor children. This person is a dependent of the insured's worker. They're not married and they have not 
previously performed um, substantial gainful earnings um, in the amount of more than the 1470 gross per month, okay? So basically how the childhood disability benefit works is that when a parent applies to receive their own social security benefits through retirement or disability, the disabled adult child is entitled to receive half of the parent's benefit. Um, this also applies to minor children that, that are not disabled, and this benefit, was, again, was formerly called DAC, okay? So, for example, if we have um, a, an adult child with a disability and mom turns on, mom or dad turns on Social Security and they get $4,000 a month, then their adult child with a disability would be entitled to $2,000 a month. Mom or dad's benefit is not reduced. This is just how the program works. And again, after 24 months of being eligible for these benefits um, and over 18, the individual will be eligible for Medicare, okay? So if we have a child that um, is qualified for childhood disability benefits under a parent's record, um, when that parent passes away, the child's benefits will be increased to 75% of the parent's amount, okay? Be aware that there are family maximums. A lot of times we have families that there's a caregiver, like one parent stays home as a caregiver, the other parent works, and so that caregiver parent may be drawing off of the spouse as well. So there are family maximums, and they go from 150 to 188% of the parent uh, of the worker's benefit, okay? And so this also, the family maximums apply to the example that I just gave. The family maximums also apply in the example that we have more than one child with a disability, which we do see that from time to time. So in that example, if dad's benefit is $4,000 a month and we have two adult children with disabilities, then each child would be eligible for 1000 a month. So they'd take the 2000 and they would split it is basically how that goes. It is possible. So usually when this happens, what happens is the person, um, your loved one will move from SSI to the CDB benefits completely over. But when there's an example of more than one child in the household, sometimes your loved ones will still get some SSI, they'll get some childhood disability benefits, they'll get both, it just depends. Um, when I say both, they're not gonna get the full amount of SSI, um, the SSI would be reduced for the, for the childhood disability benefits, but there would be, like for instance, there would be a true up, okay? So unless the childhood disability benefit amount is more, okay? so. So for SSDI to be entitled to Social Security Disability, you're going to file an application, be found to be medically disabled, be fully insured, and not working or working, but the countable income is less than the substantial gainful activity of um, 1470 gross per month, okay? So one of the things that we talk about is how to really protect your child's benefits when they're gone. You really, really want to make sure that we um, have put money where it belongs and we have money in the right buckets that's going to um, preserve their el eligibility for state and federally funded programs. Sometimes people ask me, um, so I heard that you, it doesn't really matter how much assets and income you have if you're if they're getting CDB or childhood disability benefits or um, SSDI. And that's true, kind of, but for most of our families that have kids with disabilities, um, it's not true because we still need to maintain the eligibility for Medicaid. All of the waivers in the state of Texas are Medicaid waivers. So even if your child switches over to childhood disability benefits under a parent's record and you would otherwise not care about um, how much money or assets they have or having money in the right buckets. If you want to maintain that Medicaid eligibility, these waivers I'm talking about, HCS, Texas Home Living, Community um, First Choice, uh, CLASS, those are all Medicaid waivers. So it is critically important that you don't lose sight of that in case somebody tells you, well, it doesn't matter now that you switched over. It still matters for Medicaid pr purposes for the waiver. And you can literally lose a waiver that you've been waiting 17 years to get. Our, wa our waivers interest list is very long. We have an entire webinar on the waivers um, on our YouTube channel, the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. You guys can 
uh, subscribe to that channel for free. There's over 200 webinars on topics related to planning for special needs. And um, all of these topics are complicated. So most of them are an hour long webinar. We are touching on several things today. Um, we want to ensure that your special needs family member is not set up as a beneficiary on any life insurance, investment, or bank accounts directly. So if their name is John Smith, we don't ever want John Smith to be named as a beneficiary. Um, we want it to be set up to the third party special needs trust for the benefit of John Smith, which of course you need to have a third party special needs trust and you're going to need to work with an attorney on that. You can have a standalone third party special needs trust, or you can have a testamentary third party special needs trust that will be formed upon your death. But it is really important that we don't leave money outright to our loved ones who are eligible for SSI and or Medicaid, because it, it, um, if they go over that $2,000 in assets, then they're going to lose their eligibility, and that is a real issue. The other thing that you want to be aware of is that you want to make sure that well-meaning family members don't leave assets to um, the named individual as opposed to a third-party special needs trust. As I mentioned, there are very few advisors across the U.S. that are nuanced and special needs. So your mom and dad or great aunt and uncle, grandma, and grandpa, their advisor is very unlikely um, nuanced and special needs. So when they say, I have my grandson here and I want to leave him money, they say, great. And they put it right in the grandson's name and the parents aren't even to the wiser. You find out later if that happens. So the best way to do it is to leave it to a third party special needs trust on the front end. And then there's no Medicaid payback. If we accidentally, if our children accidentally receive money, um, from somebody that wasn't expected, then, then you're going to have to form a, you're going to have to work with an attorney you're going to have to form a first party special needs trust. Sometimes we hear those of the oops trust, oops, somebody left money and it didn't go in the right bucket. And now we need to get a first party special needs trust um, for that money to go into. So <clears throat> the first party special needs trust does have a Medicaid payback. So if we set it up right on the front end, then you're going to avoid that Medicaid payback. So First party special needs trust is their money. It could be a settlement. It could be money that they earned. Um, it could be money that somebody accidentally left them to their name outright. Um, that's a first party special needs trust. And the third party special needs trust is how we leave money the right way to our loved one um, for, for their benefit. And there is no Medicaid payback on that. Okay. So we're going to talk quickly about ABLE accounts. This um, an ABLE account is under the tax code 529A. The beneficiary is the account owner. The income earned in the account is not taxable. Distributions are not taxable. Um, contributions are not deductible, but it does not jeopardize SSI or Medicaid or any other public benefits. But there are special contribution limits. So. Um, right now, this is for people whose disability started prior to age 26. That's going up to age 46, but it's not till 2026. Um, but we can put up to $17,000 a year into an ABLE account. If the individual is working, there could be an additional $13,590. This $17,000, whatever the annual gift, um, gift exclusion, gift tax exclusion is, is what the number is. This number changes a little bit. So if they're working, there can be an additional amount. You can only have one ABLE account. Anybody can put money in there. Grandma, grandpa, parents, the, the individual themselves. Um, Tax-free growth of investments, and it can be changed. You can change those investments twice a year. Uh, it could be rolled over to other family members who are eligible. If you have 529C um, for college, you can roll these um, the 529C to a 529A. It is subject to the annual contribution limit. But if it can be construed as achieving a better life for an individual with a disability, you can pay for it out of an ABLE account. So it could pay for higher education. It could pay for transition programs therapies, aids, a, a computer, adaptive equipment. I mean, it can pay for all kinds of things. So if you have a 529C and we don't know if the kid is going to go to college, um, it might be wise to move it to a 529A and then you'll have more flexibility on what you can use um, the funds for because it is for achieving a better life for an individual with a disability. Okay. So the one thing that I want to make sure that you guys understand, because a lot of times people say, well, why do I need an ABLE account and a special needs trust? Um, an ABLE account can pay for things without a one-third reduction um, to SSI. 
that a special needs trust can't. Okay. So, um, so basically an able account can pay for food and shelter. SSI is to pay for food and shelter. An able account can pay for um, food and shelter, monthly debt service, rent, utilities, food costs, things like that. An able account can pay for that without a one third reduction. A special needs trust can also pay for food and shelter, but there is a one third uh, reduction for paying for food and shelter out of a special needs trust. An ABLE account has a limited amount of money that can be in there. An ABLE account can only have $100,000 before a person disqualifies for SSI and Medicaid. You can never have more than $100,000 in an ABLE account. In a special needs trust, there's an unlimited amount of money that you can have in a special needs trust, okay? So the main thing is, is that the ABLE account can pay for food and shelter without a one-third reduction to SSI, and the special needs trust would have a one-third reduction to SSI. So I think we've um, hit on that. I'm going to keep moving. Um, so when it comes to special needs planning, I think it's important to think about who is going to care for your child when you're gone, if they're going to have care needs the rest of their life. Um, developing a future care plan now will answer these questions. Um, we always say consider post high school education and vocational options. And again, we're excited to partner with VAST um, HCC. They're going to do a presentation um, on their specific program. We have other programs that we've done um, presentations with before on the various programs for individuals with disabilities. Cons consider touring transition programs, partial care, full care, full residential care. Some of these waiting lists can be long. Some families come to us and say, there is nobody else after us. We need to know, we need to have a plan of where um, our loved one will be when we're gone. And, and so we, we help in a lot of uh, this arena and kind of, kind of thinking about planning for the future and transition planning. We also suggest making um, careful considerations before naming siblings as a future caregiver. They have hopes and dreams. They want to go to college. They want to get married and have a house and have kids and all the hopes and dreams that people have. Um, and a lot of times, unless there's like a 15 or 20 year age difference, it's just not a good fit. So really be careful and be intentional. Um, also think about naming siblings. Like if you have a sibling that's two years younger or two years older than you, you guys may all feel fall ill at the same time. So the, the future caregiver is very, very important. And those documents in place, future guardians and things like that are all going to be very, very important. Guys, we've talked about a lot of things today, and we're coming to the end, coming um, at the you know the end of our time together. These are all things that we want you to keep on your um, special needs planning radar. We do have webinars on all of these topics, future care cost estimates. People come to us and they say, how much money do we need to fund the special needs trust? We're able to put that together. And I always say small, medium, and large. What if we need some care? What if we need full care? What if we might just need an attendant or a little bit of help? We're able to put those estimates together. Um, know about the Texas waivers and the interest list. The interest list and the waiver interest list are long. Um, it's a long time before a person gets services on these lists. There are such things as crisis diversion slots. Check out our webinar on these topics. Um, we have a full webinar on ABLE accounts. We are able to help help people open ABLE accounts. So if you have additional questions on that, um, certainly reach out. Beneficiary designations are very important. Look at your life insurance with the employer, outside of the employer, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, investment statements, pensions, old retirement accounts, things like that. Check your beneficiaries. It's important. Um, we, um, we really talk about, you know, how do we fund special needs trust? Where do we get the money? If a, a family is going to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement, um, they usually need a lot of their assets that they've saved over the last 25 years for themselves. How do we fund the special needs trust? Where do we get the money? Um, on our YouTube channel, we do have um, multiple um, webinars on guardianship, alternatives to guardianship, power of attorney, health care, power of attorney, and supported decision-making agreements. Um, that process can be started six months. Um, we have qualified attorneys that um, work on that all the time, but these webinars explain how it all works. So if you've been wondering on that, if you're you know in that zone um, and you need more information on that, check out that. And again, we have um, lots of um, post high school education options for individuals with disabilities. So 
Um, there are options all across the state, all across the U.S. for um, individuals with a disability, including individuals that have an intellectual disability. There are all kinds of programs, so do check those out. Um, in today's slides, you guys are going to get a link for our upcoming webinars that we have, and you can simply um, subscribe to um, anyone, register for any of the webinars um, for topics that might be relevant to, to the journey and where you're at right now. And there, again, there's over 200 webinars on our YouTube channel that you can peruse by topic on the ones that might be relevant to you. We work on a collaborative team here at Consolidated Planning Group. We are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors, members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. So I always like you guys to have some faces uh, with names, but we do work collaboratively here. And our initial consultations are always free. So if we've kind of talked about something, you've got some questions, you need to start planning, um, you need to pick up where you left off, and um, you can um, hover your camera um, over this QR code when you get our slides, either now or when you get our um, slides, and it'll take you to a calendar where you can book a free initial Zoom consultation with us. We'll be happy to meet with you, talk to you further about your unique situation. We have had a very quiet chat box today. I think we're out of time. Um, for today. I'm going to put our contact information in the chat box one more time as well, and you guys will get that as um, in addition uh, to uh, the copy of our slides and the uh, link to the recording. It's certainly been my pleasure to be here with you today. Karen, it's been my pleasure to be here with HCC and the VAST Academy. And um, you guys can watch your email um, for, a, um, for, for a link with everything that we've talked about today. Thanks so much, everyone. I hope everybody has a great week. Take care now.